Wi-Fi, Wi-Fi were my uh, my backups for many years, but uh, I'll have to rethink that strategy. Mm. I don't know, uh, Jennifer. Now, did you notice other Morgan Hill people in the main room? Yeah, there were a number of them there. Hopefully, they'll figure out their <laughs> journey from the main room into here. Unless maybe they're thinking they'll try it out in Spanish. You never know. Yeah, maybe. <laughs> I like that. Uh, I see a, a number of people are are not assigned yet. We'll give them a couple minutes. Here. Welcome. Hello, everyone. Hey, Christy. Hi, Jen. How are you? Hi, Adam. Good. How are you? Hello. Good. Poor Daisy. <laughs> I know, right? <laughs> oh. <clears throat> She's uh, assigning folks uh, the the. Like, yeah, every yeah, pretty much hardly anyone actually was just assigned or weren't allowed. Like they nothing showed up for any of us to choose. Uh, so okay. then people just started telling her what or putting it in the chat. Okay. We'll we'll give a minute. Yeah, folks are coming in there. There's Gina. Hey, Gina. Took a while. <laughs> yeah. No, I was just telling them I feel bad for Daisy. Hi, Mike. Hey, John, we can't see you. Welcome, everybody. We'll give one, uh, just a little bit more, because it looks like there's still people coming in on the side. Christy, you said hello, and I said hello, but I was on mute, so hello. No problem. Hi, Mike. <laughs> Two days in a row. Two days in a row. We're on a roll. <laughs> While we're waiting, you, all of you who can, and I don't know, uh, Doug, on the phone, if you're able to, but you can type in the chat your name and something you love about Morgan Hill. This two people in the main room is getting smaller, so <laughs> we may just get started and we'll welcome people as they come in. Um, so we've got till about 7.20, they'll probably let us go till 7.25 for the Morgan Hill conversation. My name is David Driscoll. I'm with Fair and Driscoll Community Planning. We're supporting the process. Um, this is all about helping people understand what the housing element is, what the process looks like, answer questions, and start an important conversation about the future of housing in Morgan Hill. We're here to help make sure all voices are heard. Um, and we're gonna talk through and get some of your ideas about how we can make sure that we have good outreach uh, through the process. Um, I'm gonna hand it over to uh, Jennifer and Adam who are here from the city and they're going to start us off with a bit of a presentation and then we're gonna walk through some questions and I'll help facilitate that just to make sure everyone has a chance to talk. Okay, good evening, everyone. Let's see, there we go. And so I just want to welcome everyone. Thank you for joining our Morgan Hill breakout room on uh, this evening and for taking the time out of your day to help us with their housing element update and to give us a little bit of feedback and to see where we could go with our housing element update. So with me tonight, again, is uh, Jennifer Carmen, who's the Development Services Director for our city. And I'm Adam Piskowski, I'm Principal Planner for the Long Range Planning Division. And also uh, from the city here tonight is Christy Thomas from our Housing Division and also Gina from our Planning Division. 
So uh, David already mentioned, but for those who joined a little bit late uh, with the technical difficulties, if you can chat your name and something that you love about your community, we would greatly appreciate it. We wanna make this interactive. We will have more questions at the end of this presentation. Um, just really get feedback, help us with the housing element, uh, things that we that you see that we need in our housing element or uh, things that are working uh, housing wise within our community and really just get a lot of feedback on this, uh, one of these first meetings that we're having about the housing element update. So I'm gonna go through several of these slides while people enter in the chat. I just wanna start off with our population. Back in 1990, we had a population of about 24,000. And fast forward to today, we nearly doubled our population to almost 40 or over 46,000. So looking at and the whole county and the Bay Area wide, you can see that we had a lot of growth compared uh, to the rest of the county, even though there's more population, our percentage within Morgan Hill has changed drastically. But when we look at it closer and we see where that population is, we wanna look at age groups. So this chart shows how our population breaks down from uh, 2000 to 2010 and 2019. So in here, if you look at the age to five to 14 group, you can see that we had a pretty steady growth in population in that age group. And so we wanna pay attention to that and see where these changes happen in our community. A lot of drastic changes has happened in this side of, the, of our population for ages 55 and above, where it has nearly doubled from the year 2000. So what does that tell us? That's one of the things that HCD, the State Housing and Community Development Department, wants us to study. Uh, we have to look at our housing needs, all different types of aspects. One of them is population. And so what does this mean to our community? It shows that we have a large number of cities or a large number of seniors in our city. Uh, compared to 10 to 20 years ago, and that we may need to evaluate the need of housing for that particular population. So talking about housing, we want to see where was housing units built. And you can see here, most housing was built between the 1960s and the 90s. And right in the middle here is about when the RDCS came into play. And then after that period, where we monitored our housing more closely and at the competition for housing in our community. For that housing, how did that stock occur? How, how's it broken up between owner and renter or occupied? As you can see, a majority of our housing, 74% is owner occupied. The remaining 26% is renter occupied. And what does that mean for our city? That's another question the HCD is gonna be asking us. So one view of it is, um, that 74%, what does that mean? Are we segregating a certain population or a race by not providing more rental units, especially when we compare it to the county, which is more evenly split or closer to being evenly split and as well as with the Bay Area. So it's another thing that needs to be studied as we go through this housing element process. For a housing stock, looking at a little bit more closely, looking at the single family dwellings, and multifamily dwellings. Here you can see just how drastically our single family homes are uh, built in the city. And since uh, 2010 to 2020, for every four houses that were built, we only had one apartment unit. So one unit for every, one apartment unit for every four houses that were built in our city. So I want to touch on household income. So if you have an income of 180, I'm sorry, wait a little bit quick. So the levels of affordability are based upon area median income. And within Santa Clara County, the area median, median income is $151,300. So what is that? It means if you make up to, up to $181,550 for a four person household, you qualify for affordable housing. I wanna repeat that again. So $181,000 for a family of four qualifies for affordable housing today. With talking with about 
affordable housing. I want to talk about RENA. We touched about the RENA, or Paul touched about the RENA numbers in the uh, main room conversation. So RENA is the regional housing needs allocation, and that number allocates how many housing units are uh, divided up between each city and local jurisdictions with the counties. So for the current housing element, which is what we are in now, which runs from 2015 to 2022, we have a total of 928 housing units that are assigned to us. And this breaks it up into four categories. You have the very low income, which is the 50% area medium income. You have the low income, moderate, and then the market rate units. These numbers calculates our entire RENA number for this current cycle, this current eight years. And just because we reach a certain number doesn't mean we have to, we have to stop building. It's a, this 928 number is the bare minimum that we have to do according to the state. And as you can see in these categories, we've exceeded most of these categories, the low income, moderate income and above moderate, but we are still behind on our very low income for our city. So why are we here tonight? One of the um, reasons is for our current uh, draft final uh, RENA numbers for the current or upcoming cycle, which will run from 2023 to 2031. So as I mentioned before, um, during the last planning cycle, we had 928 units. What we had to plan for in the next eight years is 1,037 units. The breakdown is pretty much the same for these lower income, um, the very low, low and the moderate income units. We do have a higher number for the moderate income or the above uh, market rate units. And when compared to the rest of the area for the county, as well as the Bay Area, the way how they're broken down percentage wise for each group, we're pretty much the same uh, on the percentage wise. And that's a good thing. Uh, about six months ago, we were expecting this thousand units to be double or triple that. We're expecting about 3,000 units. So uh, we were surprised to see that we got the thousand unit number for our next cycle. So talking about our current housing element, uh, a couple of accomplishments that I want to point out, although there are many, um, we did update our ADU, our accessory dwelling unit ordinance. We adopted an inclusionary housing ordinance, and we also adopted several uh, housing programs. We have a low market rate program, a housing rehab program, uh, numerous homeless programs, and also a section eight program. As we talk about our future housing element and what goals do we want to achieve, uh, we have a number, number of them. Uh, one, first off, is to reach all economic segments of our community. And the reason why we want to do that is just to really reach everyone. We don't want to just concentrate on one group or um, whoever can make it out on a Tuesday or Wednesday night. We're going to be good, doing a lot more robust uh, community engagement. And we want to improve, preserve, and create safe uh, quality rental and ownership housing in Morgan Hill. In other words, we want to provide housing opportunities for everyone, regardless of social, race, or economic status. We're gonna be taking meaningful actions in addition to combating discrimination that overcome patterns of segregation and foster inclusive communities. We want to demonstrate the city's ability to provide for its fair share of affordable housing. And throughout this housing element process, we are gonna reevaluate the inclusionary housing ordinance. And overall, throughout all of this entire process, we're gonna meet the existing and projected housing needs for our city. So um, in the main room, Paul had this timeline showed up. I, this one's a little bit more geared towards Morgan Hill. During the summer in May and June, we started our community outreach with a, a series of housing element um, or housing site, um, workshops. And we expect to go through that throughout this entire process, uh, probably through autumn of 2022. And starting now up until early 2022, uh, we are gonna be working on studies and the draft update of the housing element with the draft for review about the spring of 2022, followed by public hearings and the planning commission 
and the city council. And as uh, Paul mentioned in the main session, our housing element is due, or the final version is due in January of 2023. So finally on this last slide, I just want to touch on the next steps. Um, so we are going to evaluate our housing needs assessment, which is examining those demographics, the employment and the housing trends that affect housing needs of the city. Uh, basically all those slides or the data tables that I've showed there in this meeting, as well as a lot more. We're going to review our prior housing element to measure progress in implementing policies and programs. We're going to conduct a site's inventory review where we're going to identify if we have enough land zoned for housing to meet our arena number, that 1,037 units. And then, as I mentioned pre uh, before, we're going to do additional outreach meetings to come with a particular focus uh, or with a particular focus on outreach to traditionally underrepresented groups. So when I end this conversation uh, or this PowerPoint, I'm gonna take my email and also this website and post it in the chat. For anyone who wants to contact me, um, I'm gonna be the primary lead on the housing element update. So I'll post my email address in the chat. And we also have a housing element update webpage uh, that will be updated every now and then. Uh, there'll be information about future public workshops or community uh, workshops for the housing element. And on the housing element update uh, webpage, we also have a notify me list. I encourage everyone to sign up for that. And that will be the best way to get notified of future meetings. So with that, I'll conclude my presentation. I'll open up for questions. And within the next couple of minutes, I'll post those, the website as well as my email in the chat. Great, thanks, Adam. So yeah, so let's, um, if you wanna stop sharing screen, then we can all see each other better, awesome. And yeah, any questions related to the information uh, that Adam just walked through? Yeah, go, John. Adam, are you confident that we could meet RENA goals with the lands already within the USA? We're evaluating that, but I, we, I, I'm confident we could. Um, the way, the <clears throat> only question is, how do we get there? Um, we do have enough undeveloped land in there, but we do have uh, commercial industrial land that hasn't been developed yet. And so it's struggling all these different policies and uh, what, how we wanna see our entire city in the future. Um, we don't wanna convert all of our industrial and commercial land to residential, um, but there's, uh, other ways in order to achieve it. Uh, first, we have to do that inventory. We have to check to see how much current land we have that, are, that is zoned residential to see if we can fit um, those thousand units within our existing vacant land that is zoned residential. So the sites in Morgan Hill are pretty scarce for raw land and just as limited for redevelopment area. And I know we have policies now that speak to not converting land designated from non-residential to residential, at some point, something's going to have to give. Um, what's your thoughts? Um, so since we haven't really gone through that process yet, it's hard to really give you an, a good answer right now. But uh, we will take a look at everything at first. Um, depending on where the units are that, we need, that we're lacking or the zoning that we're lacking, uh, it may be where we might have to look at areas to upzone either, and when I say upzone, I mean make it more intensified, where we might have a single family homes zone for, on vacant land and make it allowed to have a multifamily if those are the areas that we're lacking. But it's, it's really hard to give you an answer now though, but. Uh, I'd say the, yeah, the, the process ahead is to explore alternatives about mm -hmm. how you could get there and to engage the community in talking about trade-offs between alternative ways. And Adam will be facilitating the process, but not making the decisions. Uh, sure. that would, yeah. Well, and, and the city may not even need to make the decisions. There are several pieces of legislation moving forward in the state that could make that decision for us. The, there was a piece, SB6, that was looking at commercial conversion. Um, that has been made a two-year bill and won't be considered until the next legislative cycle. Um, but there are other bills that allow lot splits um, and densifying single-family areas. 
and those may actually create capacity um, within the city that we didn't even know about. As Adam said, when we were looking at um, the overall numbers of what could have been a straight distribution based on either population or size, we were anticipating a much larger number. Mm -hmm. And the idea of being able to find that capacity within the city was much more of a concern at that time. We're very lucky that the methodology was focused on um, jobs and transit, of which we're, we're working on that job thing, but we're lacking in transit. And so our number turned out to be much lower than expected. Yeah, many communities have gotten the arena numbers for this upcoming planning period that are three times their last numbers. So. Mm -hmm. um, I, I just put a link in the chat to a notes page as a Google Doc where I'm just going to capture notes. So John, your point that you brought up about sort of the lack of vacant land and policies about conversion of non-residential to residential, I've captured that there. Um, there's five questions that we wanted to walk through. And the first one we asked you to just put in the chat, which is what do you value and love about the community today? If people have additional thoughts, add them in the chat there. Um, and then the next question is on sort of what do you see as some of the needs, challenges, and opportunities that you would like to see the process consider and address and um, come up with some responses to. So others, other thoughts on the needs, challenges, opportunities. Well, one, one that's really obvious is, is extremely low income housing, right? And, and, and Adam, I'm, I'm curious, is, are you okay with the low income housing being joined with extremely low income housing? I mean, given the importance of them and, and the challenge, why would we put those two together? It seems like they should be, if anything should be separated, those two are the ones that should be separated. Right. And through this process, uh, we are gonna separate them. We're gonna call out where or we'll divide up the number of units that would be extremely low income. Uh, the state left it up to the local jurisdictions to figure out and decide how many units are appropriate within the extremely low versus the very low. So while we go through this process, we will study it, we'll evaluate and figure out um, how to divide those up and what's an appropriate number for each category. Others have thoughts in terms of, and we can combine thinking about both needs and challenges and also ideas you have about how those could be responded to resolve. And I'm, I'm really good at just calling on people. So you can either volunteer or I'll call your name. Uh, Doug Muirhead would like to comment. Sure. Uh, a couple of things. I live in an apartment. Uh, 10 years ago, I was worried that I was going to uh, be forced out because the uh, owner might want to do a conversion to condos. I believe the city has a requirement that we have to have a 4% vacancy rate before that can happen. So that's, that's my comment on living in the 24% of not single family owners. As far as affordable housing is concerned, I, I am concerned that we really can't build enough of that kind of housing. And I suggested to supervisors Watson and, and Chavez that perhaps we should start talking about basic shelter for a certain percent of uh, the unhoused population. It was a very nice presentation on a tiny home village given to Hewitt, uh, the county policy uh, committee several years ago. And my final comment has to do with uh, apartments near some of our fancier uh, subdivisions. Um, you had a uh, planning commission meeting a couple of months ago on Cochrane Commons expansion. And the plan was, as presented, had some uh, multifamily housing in it. And uh, a group of homeowners nearby said that uh, they were opposed to that because they felt it would bring down their, their property values. So I, I see that as a rather large problem. So those are my comments on opportunities and challenges. Thank you. Great, thank you. And Felicia, I see you have your hand up. 
Uh, yeah, so I just kind of wanted to, to piggyback off of uh, Mike's comments earlier regarding um, ELI housing. Um, so I know that we saw in Adam's slides earlier that you guys have really been, uh, the city of Morgan Hill, sorry, has really, really um, good about getting all these other um, housing needs met as far as the other income categories, whereas very low in ELI housing has been, unfortunately, it looks like below 30%. Um, so I am actually a housing advocate. I work with housing choices. Um, we work with people with intellectual and developmental disabilities. Um, many of the people that we work with, they have very limited income, fixed incomes are dependent on SSI. Um, and you know, it's becoming extremely more difficult, um, not even just ELI housing, but because of the high area median income in Santa Clara County, as we saw earlier, 121,000 for a single person. Um, it, it's making even affordable housing even less affordable for people who are on fixed incomes. Um, so like in this 2021, the maximum SSI is $955 a month. Uh, so if there's someone with a disability who's dependent on that, that's their only source of income, they can't even get into ELI housing. Um, I'm just kind of wondering what what ideas the city might have for how to create opportunities for people um, with disabilities or other um, other community members who are on fixed incomes who can't even qualify for ELI housing. So I I've encourage anyone that has ideas on the response. Again, we're not uh, going to figure things out today, but uh, that's a really important issue that was brought up. Um, it is a challenge. The area median income is, is so high that a lot of people, I mean, 30% of, of the AMI is still, still a pretty high number that a lot of people fall under, particularly if you're a person with disabilities on a fixed income relying on um, support. So, I, I do know that Christy and Rebecca are working on fixing it. <laughs> okay, good. We do. We have lots of ideas, but, you know, it takes a lot of policy change and it takes a lot of funding. So we, we have the same, the same worries and, um, you know, we are, we are working to try to create policy to help, help those folks. Mike, I think for you, yes, we were in a meeting yesterday. Mike was talking about the basic income um, policy, basically where, you know, folks would possibly be getting a basic income that could increase their SSI. So there's those ideas out there right now kind of being chattered about. Um, and the Section 8 uh, housing list is open right now. So I've been trying to get that information out to everyone so that maybe those folks that are on SSI could possibly qualify for a voucher if they can't get any more income to help them stay in those units. But we're open to any sort of suggestions, any sort of creative thinking would be is great. That is the city at all partnering with um, Housing Authority as far as project use vouchers in future developments? So we do, we have, um, so we just recently had two developments that came through that both have um, project-based vouchers. And we have two other um, developments that are coming through right now. Um, one's called the Magnolia and on um, Monterey Road. And another is the UHC housing, um, it's called the Crossings on Watsonville and both will have permanent supportive housing units with vouchers. Great joke, yeah. Hey, good evening. Sorry for the uh, lack of video. I'm, I'm uh, on a mobile device. So I don't even know how to use video on that. So uh, I, just a quick comment on the, I, this is maybe city specific because I don't think the county has an inclusionary housing program. Um, several people have mentioned this over the last few months, given that that's going to be looked at. I, I really hope that uh, there is a look at including um, non-residential builders in that program, given we're, um, making, I would say, uh, allowing uh, or uh, permitting uh, very uh, large industrial players to come in here. And one of the reasons they're claiming they're doing that is because they wanna get uh, local jobs uh, there. Um, it, it seems uh, inconsistent to uh, not consider um, having those participants, commercial uh, participants uh, participate in helping for the inclusionary housing ordinance. And so I hope there's a way to do that uh, as we look at that. Thank you. Thanks, Joe. Others, challenges, ideas, how to respond to the challenges. No one else? Gina, we haven't heard from you. Yeah, 
you know, I'm just kind of taking it in right now. I, I process a lot of the affordable housing projects right now. And so I'm just seeing the, the struggle that the actual affordable housing developers have going through the tax credit um, process and all the documentation they have to really try to provide these housing projects. And then I see all the emails that we get from the community that need these housing projects. So it's really, the, we need to help everyone, you know, those developers that really want to provide the housing and then those that really need to get into these housing projects. So there's, everyone needs a lot of help right now. Yeah, yep, that's for sure. I need and limited resources. Right. Mike or John, any additional points? Okay. One of the other things we wanted to ask you about is ideas you have about how the city can make this process as inclusive as possible, how to you know, do outreach, um, reach people who we don't hear from. Any thoughts you have on how we can better reach the community? Uh, I think one thing that's been really popular um, throughout different cities that I've, I've visited housing element meetings for is um, now that COVID restrictions are kind of um, lifting a lot, uh, doing like pop-up events at farmer's markets or other community events. Um, also maybe partnering with uh, different service providers. Uh, so especially like for disability community, um, having someone that they are even um, community leaders such as churches, people, places that people trust and will feel uh, willing to share this kind of information with. Great, thanks. Others? Jennifer, aren't we doing that already? Reaching out to faith-based organizations and I get blasts from City Morgan Hill all the time. Yes, we are. That so our, our housing team is, is incredibly active in reaching out to all of our community-based organizations and trying to pull that group together as part of getting ready for this overall housing element work. Um, and they're doing that anyways, just to promote housing in the community. That's great. Any other thoughts on how to make sure we've got good participation? Does the, this kind of Zoom format work for you guys, or are there other ways that you would like to be involved and ways that you'd like to receive information? Uh, this is Joe, can I make a comment? Mm -hmm. uh, I think one big challenge, but to, if you really want to get more community involvement is to um, think about uh, Mr. Muirhead's question, how to address the fact that um, for very a lot of people, the initial, um, the initial response is, I don't want to uh, have additional housing reduce my uh, property value. And there has to be an answer to that uh, to get those people from uh, being uh, inherently uh, opposed to uh, engaging in the discussion, I think. Yeah. Yeah, I know there's a lot of ongoing education in terms of what, what we mean when we say affordable housing. Um, and I think a lot of people, when they actually see those AMI numbers and you say that's, you can make $100,000 a year and qualify for affordable housing, they, they don't understand. Um, but that's one of the challenges of the Santa Clara County region. Yeah, it's been a huge disconnect for the community. Um, and when, and that AMI number has jumped so much just within the last couple of years. Um, I believe it was at 123 to one, and then it went a little bit higher, and now it's at 151 as the as the AMI, and which is just crazy. When I talk to friends in other states or other communities, they're just what what is happening there? I'm like Silicon Valley. That's yes. why the numbers are high. It, it really is an education because we have you know people that um, get really upset about the affordable housing projects coming in, and and it's really about the education because they're they're scrambling to sell their property because they are so afraid of the property values. And it's, you know, they need to understand that these are, these are teachers, these are other, you know, workers in the community that need these housing units. Yeah. And it's, there's this stigma of affordable housing. Well, it's, um, 
you know, it's, it's, it's the teachers, it's the firefighters, it's that need these housing units. Yeah, yeah. So it, I, was, I was thinking of slightly different angle though. It, it's not just the AMI and, and hammering that, but the fact that people like UHC and, and that they're organizations that, that, that it's not just about building houses and, and then letting them go, whoever happens to come along, especially with the lower income housing, these are organizations that uh, provide uh, services and, and, and many of their units look very nice. It may not be as much worry as people have into what's gonna happen in the neighborhood. That's true, yes. One of the messages, yeah. one of the messages I think that we need to get out is, is in Santa Clara County, 48% of extremely low income renters are paying greater than 50%. They're extremely burdened, right? And that's half of the extremely low income renters. Okay, I mean, just, you, you don't have to be really good at math to think if I'm paying 50% of my gross. Right, well, and particularly if you're low income, 50% of your gross does not leave you much left okay. to meet all your needs. That is the problem. We're not talking about homelessness or people with problems. We're talking about people that are renting right now. 48% yep. of them in that situation. That's that message needs to get out. Yeah, yeah, that's true. And what one way to look at it as is if those people are only paying 30% of their rent of their income towards rent rather than 50%, they have more income to put back out into the community <clears throat> to pay more sales tax, to pay to the dentist, to pay to you know all the local businesses. So it really does help the economy for everyone if they are paying less rent, rent that they can afford. Yep. I'm going to jump quickly to our last question. I know they're going to bump us back to the main room soon, but it's my favorite question, which is, okay, we've got all these challenges and obstacles, and it seems like a hard road ahead. What does success look like? It's 2030, and you've achieved what you want to achieve. What does that look like? What's happened? You can talk about specific locations in town. You could talk about who's being served and what that looks like. What comes to mind? Well, I hate to be myopic, but I would like to see close to 100% of, of people being able to spend 30% or less of their income on housing. It seems, good, like, it cool. seems like something we as a community owe to the community. Others. It's hard to envision success. Yes, very hard. Because <laughs> even if even if you build housing, there's there's so many other infrastructure problems in in a, a very very challenging budget environment, and uh, uh, the state may be focused on getting people in housing, but um, it does nobody any good if you can't get in your car and, and move across town in a reasonable amount of time. So I think it is a huge challenge. Well, it's maybe something to work on in the coming months on the house element is sort of try to envision what that success looks like. But it's hard to work towards something if you don't want it as you're, you're working towards. Because building new housing is going to change aspects of the community. And there might be some places where that change could really be a positive, great, help create the place that people enjoy, as well as creating affordability. We have uh, four 100% affordable housing projects moving forward, and I just want to see them all succeed and get the funding that they need to develop. We have one that's been approved now for, yeah. gosh, it's been almost, well, not quite a year yet, but they haven't been able to, it's going to be um, a modular construction, but they haven't been able to move forward because they can't get a builder for the modulars. We have another one that will also be modular construction. So I'm fearful once they get to that stage that they won't also be able to move forward. So I'd like to see them actually be successful and, and all of them get the funding that they need and move forward. That's great. Yeah, the mod modular housing is, is difficult right now because it's so overloaded. Right. And so folks that have contracts with modular construction are actually getting the, we can't, we can't fill your order, sorry sort of response, so. If I may comment? Yes, please, yeah. Uh, I, ha I have to react to the, the statement that was just made about people getting in their cars and driving across town. That is 
not what I want to see. I very much would like to see uh, local serving businesses uh, throughout the town so that people can walk and bike and, and have other options than as I currently do today, get in my car and drive from the south end of the city to the north to go to Target. Um, but I also. That's a great point. Well, now we I know if you're wanna, on your, oh, here we go. I just want to, to to note that I live a two minute walk from Knob Hill, my eye doctor, the donut shop, my bank. Uh, it works really well for me. And I think other people might enjoy those sort of conveniences. Although having a, a home where I'm the owner and decision maker would also be nice. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. I just we we have 20 seconds before we get pumped out. I just want to thank everyone for coming and giving your time, participating, and hopefully you stay involved. And uh, one great way to expand participation is commit to bringing people you know, neighbors, friends, family to participate in these conversations as forward. Thank you everyone for being here. Thank you everyone.